How we how we pulled this off? Um, uh, how we how we managed to, to to get the court to decide the case on a timetable that was suitable for our rescheduled date? Unfortunately, this is a trade secret. It's it's not information <laughs> that I'm entitled to share, except that uh, there is a an old proverb that that, that springs to mind here which is that even a stuck clock is right twice a day. Um, we were very lucky, what could I say? And we are especially lucky to have this amazing panel to, to talk today. Um, th those of you who heard me talk recently know that somehow increasingly I, 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 I tend to refer back to proverbial wisdom. So the, the, the the guy who sort of taught me about the amount of, of, of life understanding that can be packed into simple proverbs always emphasized that proverbs tend to come in pairs and that often there is a proverb on each side to, to cover the situation as you find it. So we know absence makes the heart grow fonder, but we also know out of heart, out of mind. And depending on the situation, you have a proverb to, to match. And then, of course, there is the old proverbial expression that too many cooks spoil the broth, and it has as its counterpart there are several possibilities, the more the merrier, but the one I like is many hands make light work. And what this panel today demonstrates is that many hands contribute to a major Supreme Court decision, or for that matter, in, to any other major development in or, or pronouncement about law, some of the, the hands are, are playing uh, featured roles, and others are, are, are spear carriers, and still others are, are, are backstage. But all of their contributions are essential to the outcome. And today we have a fascinating mix of participants. I am going to do the briefest of introductions, because if I were to give introductions that were uh, appropriate in extent to the qualifications of our panelists, I would use up all our time. So um, we have to my immediate left Eleonora Zlotnikova, who was the counsel for petitioner in the case from the, the Sam Israel law firm. We have um, next to Eleonora, and let's make sure I'm getting this right. We have Ariel Lavenbook, who 
was has been involved in this issue for a long time first when it it appeared in the in the guise of of the the uh, dispute between Costco and Omega he helped to represent Costco at that time and filed an amicus brief on this go round Kurtzing against Wiley on behalf of Costco then we have next to him Aaron Panner, who was the who was counsel to Omega on the first round and filed an amicus for Omega on this round. Brandon Butler from the Association of Research Libraries, which participated very actively in the Friend of the Court briefing in both of the rounds in question. Next to him, John Band um, from the bandwidth policy, policy bandwidth law firm, and who also contributed substantially to the library amicus briefing. And finally, Alan Adler from the Association of American Publishers, uh, another uh, closely involved organization. And all of these wonderful individuals and many more were essential parts of the complicated process that produced the decision of this week. A decision which is basically concerned with the meaning of four little words. And those words on which the opinion, or I should say the opinions, because we have a, a, a rich and varied selection of views from various members of the Supreme Court turned are, of course, the little words, excuse me, five little words, lawfully made under this title. And I thought that just to begin, I, I would ask Eleonora to say a little bit about the, the background of the case and the, the outcome for which you argued in the case. Well, first, let me just say thank you for having me, and I'm incredibly humbled to be here along with my such esteemed co-panelists. Um, as far as the background goes, uh, Subhak Kurt Sang was a student who hailed from Thailand and came to the United States in order to pursue um, a degree and then a doctorate degree in mathematics. While he was studying here to obtain his uh, his degrees, he um, had his friends and relatives purchase certain textbooks abroad in Thailand and then uh, those textbooks were shipped over to him in the United States and then uh, at that time he had resold the textbooks on eBay um, to just to third-party consumers and uh, Supap was sued by uh, the textbook publisher for a copyright infringement because the textbook publisher was um, claiming that Supab didn't have the right to resell the textbooks, even though he had lawfully, or his family had lawfully purchased them abroad. And the issue then just turned on the interpretation of the first sale doctrine and whether it has a geographic uh, sort of limitation with respect to where the textbooks were manufactured. Now, I, I, I met Sam and I actually um, began working with Sam after the case had already been decided in the district, at the district level, and from from what I know and from what Sam had told me, it was an uphill battle. And when he brought this first sale defense, he he was met with um, extreme skepticism, and specifically because it was an issue of first impression and because no one had asserted this first sale defense in the Second Circuit um, in this specific scenario where the goods were manufactured overseas. Um, and so that's where the battle began, and I think um, Really, it was an issue of uh, it being illogical to be able to use this doctrine in the United States with respect to the goods that were uh, manufactured here domestically and not be able to use this, this sort of long embedded principle that is so intuitive to most of us um, with respect to goods that were made overseas. And I think that really, that and Supap's battle, Supap's personal battle really propelled the, um, the battle in the district level and then at the uh, Second Circuit, and unfortunately we lost to both. And then uh, uh, 
recently, a couple of days ago, I'm sure you're aware that uh, the, we, we actually got a favorable decision, so we've, uh, we've been celebrating. <laughs> <laughs> We've, uh, as for Supap, I'm sure he's going to be very happy to learn that um, the $600,000 uh, judgment against him is going to be thrown out, and um, you know he can freely visit the United States without it hanging over his head. We've tried to reach him; we haven't been able to, um, but I'm sure he'll be very happy to learn this. Thank you. <laughs> so I want to spend as as much of the the precious time we have with this group today as possible talking about where we go from here because the the opinions to a very large extent do speak for themselves and they speak loudly and in in very strong contrast to one another but since Eleanor has explained a little bit of the the genesis of the lawsuit and the essential rationale that the Kurtzang team urged on the court and that was accepted by the majority. I wanted to ask Alan if, if you could say a little bit about, I, we don't have unfortunately anyone here to speak directly for John Wiley, but I wondered if you could say a little bit about where the publishing community stands with respect to these issues and, and why they are of importance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I originally accepted this invitation on the relative certainty that the court will not have decided the case by the time we came. <laughs> so it was going to be a lot easier to talk about our brief and, and what our rationales were. And, of course, now we have to discuss the, the decision. So the difference is, is that when we get to discussing the decision, I have to issue the usual lawyer's disclaimer, but I can talk a little bit more about what the position of the industry was going in. Um, basically, the, the industry's view of this was that uh, we had been involved back in the 1960s um, in the long, very lengthy set of hearings that Congress had held uh, that ultimately led to the comprehensive reform of the Copyright Act in 1976. But in the mid-60s, one of the areas that there were a series of hearings and discussions and studies that focused on was the question of uh, importation. And the issue of importation became very important uh, as it became more and more clear that the industries that were creating copyright-based products in the United States uh, were going to find themselves more and more engaged in exportation uh, of those products. Now, exportation was going to mean that in some instances the products would not be exactly identical to the way they were, uh, their products were uh, distributed in the United States. In many re uh, 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 regions, the reason for that was going to be that in order to be able to establish a foreign market, for these products. One had to take cognizance of the fact that standards of living, uh, questions of how the government subsidizes or doesn't subsidize certain activities were going to mean that um, probably the populations that wanted these products in those foreign markets would not be able to necessarily afford them at the prices that they were typically available in the United States. So one of the things that began to develop was this notion that if the Copyright Act uh, contains as one of the exclusive rights for copyright owners the right with respect to distribution of those works. One of the questions was whether or not that principle combined with the principle of the divisibility of the rights of copyright, which was a major change in the 1976 Act from uh, the 1909 Act, ultimately meant that it was contemplated that U.S. copyright owners could in fact sell their products uh, in foreign markets and would have the ability, if they needed to differentiate those products in terms of the, the quality, the features of the product, but most importantly in terms of the prices at which the products were available or other terms and conditions uh, on, on the availability of those products in foreign markets, that they could expect that they would be able to essentially engage in market segmentation. 
so that the products that they priced lower in order to establish markets in foreign regions outside the United States wouldn't come back in the United States to compete with their own products, their versions of the products in the United States that sold here and perhaps exhibited a different quality, were sold under different terms and conditions with respect to use, and also were sold at different prices. So the idea of market segmentation really gained hold as we moved forward into the 1990s and the 21st century where it became clear that global trade in products that were copyright based and created in the United States was going to be a very critical part of the U.S. economy and a very critical part of the ability of these companies in the United States to develop and grow their businesses. And it seemed to us that in those circumstances, there was a distinction to be made between the situation of whether or not somebody could travel abroad and purchase a foreign version or a foreign edition, as it were, of a book produced by a U.S. copyright owner, by a U.S. publisher, and bring it back to the United States for their own personal use, or whether or not a library or an educational institution or an archive could purchase foreign editions of works and make them part of their collections in the United States, that those issues could be distinguished from the situation of somebody who was basically going to engage in arbitrage. Arbitrage being basically, to sum it up as easily as possible, buying low and selling high, capitalizing on the differences between which similar or identical goods are sold in different markets. And the notion that somebody would be able to utilize the first sale doctrine as a justification for engaging in arbitrage with respect to textbooks that were prepared specifically for the students in foreign markets and purchase them at those lower prices and then bring them back in the United States to sell them in competition with the same publisher's U.S. version of that works, was something that we believed the importation prohibitions in Section 602 were designed to prevent. We believed that the discussions, the hearings, made it quite clear that Congress understood as it was shaping Section 602 that one of the considerations involved was the fact that they expected and indeed wanted to facilitate the ability of American copyright-based industries to establish markets for their products abroad because that would be good for the U.S. economy as a whole. So that was the reason why when we saw what John Wiley explained to us what Kurtzsang was doing and what its reaction was going to be to that, it shouldn't be a surprise that the response from the other members of AAP was quite similar to John Wiley's. This isn't what Congress contemplated. It certainly wasn't what Congress contemplated with respect to its codification of the first sale doctrine, which occurred contemporaneously with its enactment of the Section 602 prohibitions with respect to unauthorized importation of copyrighted works from U.S. publishers. So when the cases, you know, of course went to court, we first had the Quality King case, which never reached this issue because of the distinction that was made about whether or not we were talking about goods that had made essentially a round trip, as the court referred to it, as opposed to goods that were manufactured abroad with the intention that they would only be distributed abroad in foreign markets. That case, of course, emerged in the Costco case, but the court couldn't resolve it because of Justice Kagan's recusal and the fact that they split four to four. So when we saw this, the John Wiley case, move its way up through the District Court in New York to the Second Circuit, it became pretty clear to us that this case was going to end up in the Supreme Court. And therefore, the position that we were going to be taking there was one that was going to be guided basically by two principal considerations. One was the notion of the general recognition in the American business community and under American law that market segmentation, particularly when you're dealing with markets outside the United States, was not inappropriate, did not run afoul of antitrust law or any other anti-competitive rules in U.S. law, and was in fact something that Congress had contemplated in the way that it crafted Section 602, including the fact that it built into that provision specific exceptions so that it was trying to make sure that some of the potential adverse consequences of that provision would be mitigated right from the outset. And our argument 
uh, in the brief we filed, trace the history of the enactment of Section 602 for the Court. It talked about the importance of market segmentation for the ability of U.S. businesses uh, to be able to develop and grow by establishing foreign markets as well as participating in domestic markets. And also, of course, we viewed the notion of the first sale doctrine in the way it had traditionally been understood as consistent with the fact that U.S. law uh, basically was modeled on a principle of national exhaustion, not one of international exhaustion with respect to uh, the purchase of, of copies of copyrighted works. And we thought, quite frankly, that although the Second Circuit's decision was in some ways uh, more strict and restricting, uh, than the Ninth Circuit decision had been in the Costco case, we thought that nevertheless there was a pretty good chance that with Justice Kagan now participating, um, there would be an affirmance of the Second Circuit decision. We certainly uh, anticipated that it was going to be a split decision. We didn't think the court would be unanimous. But frankly, we were surprised when the court came out with a 6-3 to three decision where it was very difficult to tell why certain justices took the positions they took. Uh, just for example, um, Justice Sotomayor, if you looked at her questioning uh, of the parties at the oral argument, it's hard to imagine how she came out as part of the majority uh, decision without any comment at all uh, explaining her rationale. Similarly, uh, we also were a little bit uh, puzzled at the fact that Justice Scalia joined Justice Ginsburg's dissent but Justice Thomas decided to join the majority again when he did not participate in the oral argument in any meaningful way and did not offer any indication ultimately in the decision of why he thought the majority had decided this case correctly. So the one thing we've come out with, and this goes to Peter's question about where we go from here, that I think is at least a, a bright aspect of this case for us is, I think it's fair to say that a supermajority of the court if not the court unanimously, believes that ultimately these are public policy questions that have to be revisited and resolved by Congress. This is not a matter of constitutional law. This is a matter of public policy as implemented through statutory enactment, and that's the business of Congress. So I think there were enough hints and clues, uh, even within Justice Breyer's opinion for the majority, certainly within uh, Justice Kagan's concurrence and Justice Ginsburg's dissent, that we're going to see this issue revisited by Congress, and that's where it should be taken care of. And that's where I'd like very much for this discussion to go in a moment. But I do also want to give... Um, Ariel and Aaron, who have worked so hard on the, the, the legal theories of this case in not one but two rounds of litigation, an opportunity to offer their views of the decision as it, as it stands before we, we move on to the question of the, the future trajectory. Maybe, maybe Ariel, starting with you? Sure. Um, certainly, thank you very much for, for having me here. Um, th there's, there's a lot that could be said about the decision, but I think I'll focus on one aspect of it um, that reflects some of the work that Costco did um, this time around. So um, our view coming out of the 4-4 split when, when we had the case in front of the court w w was really that we had learned two things, I think. The first one was that the court was less concerned about some of the dicta and quality king that the parties in Costco v. Omega had spent a lot of time talking about. We came to realize that perhaps that, that wasn't true and that might inform the way that somebody would advocate for this position the second time around. But the second thing that, that sort of, I wouldn't say it dawned on us, but we, we really start, started to realize the strength of the legislative history argument that, that the folks advocating on behalf of Omega and, and John Wiley and Sons were making. And it, it's certainly something that if you read the Second Circuit's opinion, but also the Ninth Circuit's opinion and a lot of the, the district court opinions, um, they sort of take for granted the narrative that you just heard, which is that publishers went to Congress and said, we want to be able to divide markets, and that was the whole reason that 602 was enacted. And so it makes no sense to have a ruling that says otherwise. So um, one of the things we did in preparation for the second round was to go back to the legislative history and see whether or not that, in fact, was borne out. Um, and, and what we found was that it is certainly the case that publishers uh, went 
before the drafters and before Congress and said, look, this is what we'd like to do. And that was certainly one thing on the minds of the people that were crafting the text of 602. But it wasn't the only thing they were trying to solve. And in fact, it turns out there are a variety of different issues that the drafters were wrestling with when they were thinking through the language. And I'll give you some examples. One of them that I believe Justice Breyer mentions is that the movie industry had an issue where they would, they didn't sell their movies, they leased them to people. And what they were finding was that the people they were leasing them to overseas in, say, Canada, were smuggling them across the border into the U.S. And as many of you know, the movie studios like to control the dates on which their movies get released. So if they intended for a movie to debut in Canada in January, and for that same movie to debut in the United States in March, they were finding that people that had access to the film in Canada were smuggling it into the United States and releasing it early. And people were coming in front of the drafters and saying, we need an importation provision that will address that. You had a different group of people that came up and they said, look, one of the issues that we face is that there are laws in foreign countries that will allow for the creation of our copyrighted works without any compensation being paid to us. Just as a matter of, I don't want to choose a country in particular, but as a matter of country X's law, it's permissible for somebody to create a copy of this book and not pay us. Well, that having been happened, people are going to that country, they're buying the book and they're bringing it into the United States. As a matter of law, those works weren't piratical in the countries that they were being made. So the laws that prohibited piratical importation, it wasn't clear that they were actually covering that scenario. So people said, we need an importation provision that's going to address this. And as we looked over the legislative history, it appeared as though there was a lot of different things that were going on. And we hadn't actually seen any court confronted with the idea that 602 may not actually, in its enactment, have intended to cover the publishing scenario, but that it intended to cover some of these other scenarios, all of which 602 remains to cover, even given Justice Breyer's reading of it. So this time around, we felt like there was value in having a counter narrative, which is what we put forward in our amicus brief. And I think I think that's something that comes through in Justice Breyer's opinion. Aaron. Well, I think that the decision is very interesting. I think the fact that there were three opinions is very interesting. The Quality King decision, which says that 602A1, and I assume everyone in the room is more or less familiar with how this case is set up, but basically 602A1, when you read it, is a pretty straightforward importation ban. It says that you can't import works that you've acquired abroad without the permission of the copyright holder. It seems pretty clear. But it says that doing so is a violation of the right to exclusive distribution under 1063 of the Copyright Act. And in Quality King, that formulation and the specific reference to 1063 turned out to be quite significant to the court, which said, well, since 1063 is subject to first sale doctrine and first sale defense, the importation provision must be subject to the first sale defense as well. And that was the holding of Quality King, was that the importation provision was subject to first sale defense. And then the question became for the lower courts, well, so what's the scope of the first sale defense with respect to copies that are manufactured abroad? And the courts continued to essentially, I think, reflect the very strong instinct that what Congress intended to do with 602A and now 602A1 was to provide a remedy against importation of copies that have been sold in foreign markets at low prices, you know, produced potentially with different standards, but most obviously done for purposes of dealing in a market where, you know, the ability to purchase these goods is lower and so prices need to be lower. And reflecting that and seizing on dicta in the Quality King decision itself, they said, look, the particular phrasing of the first sale defense is it applies to copies that are lawfully made under this title. And so in the Quality King decision itself and in the later cases in the lower courts, 
um, people said, well, lawfully made under this title wouldn't, uh, you know, wouldn't reach copies that are made um, abroad because they aren't made, uh, you know, co U.S. copyright doesn't apply abroad, and so these co these copies aren't lawfully made under this title. Um, and the difficulty with that is not in the case itself, right? Nobody actually thinks, um, sparing the feelings of your client, no one thinks that the result in the Kurtzang case was um, inappropriate. That is, what he did was very much at the core of what 602A1 was intended to prevent. But um, there are all sorts of statutory problems that are created as a result of reading lawfully made under this title in the way that the Second Circuit read it. Um, and in terms of a post-mortem and trying to figure out this decision, um, the way the case was presented to the Supreme Court, I think actually more so this go-round than uh, in the prior case, and um, that may have something to do with the sort of the, the fact that at least one justice, well, I should say, I suppose theoretically at least one, but probably one justice switched uh, position, um, had to do with the fact that the reading of um, lawfully made under this title as lawfully made in the United States um, was the reading the Second Circuit adopted, and it was very much um, grabbed by uh, the advocates, I think, as being a simple, straightforward reading. But it creates all sorts of problems with other provisions in the statute. Um, and those problems are really unacceptable. They, it just can't be the case that, for example, and, no, and I don't think the publishers would say it's the case, that if the publisher prints a copy of a book in Mexico and then imports it, that it's not subject to the first sale doctrine because it was printed in Mexico. No one thinks that that's the right result. And so it was a very significant problem for a court trying to make sense of the language of the statute um, to try to deal with that. And the, the, frankly, there were, two, there were two answers that were given in this case by the parties, uh, well, one by, one by Wiley and one by the United States. And Wiley essentially said, it hasn't been a problem, don't worry about it. Um, and the United States said, uh, common law first sale doctrine can deal with that. And both of those answers are kind of hard to swallow. The first answer is hard to swallow because, you know, we're writing this decision and if we're creating this, these massive problems, that we're going to have to deal with later, that's really not so hot. And, you know, everybody thinks these results are quite unattractive. And, you know, Justice Breyer writes it rather persuasively that, you know, saying that, you know, nobody's going to try to do it isn't really a very good answer. Um, and the United States' argument um, was one that Justice Ginsburg found to be persuasive. Um, but the difficulty with that answer is, why did Congress codify the first sale doctrine if it intended to leave the common law first sale defense in place? Um, it just is a strange thing to say that you don't really need the statute and what the statutes, you know, the limitations that are built into the statute don't really matter because we still have the common law there, which sort of takes care of everything that the um, statute doesn't take care of. And, you know, Faced with those choices, what happened was actually um, Malcolm Stewart, the uh, Deputy Solicitor General, was asked at argument by Justice Alito, said very directly, look, if you had to choose, if you had to choose between the really lousy results that are threatened by the reading that Wiley seems to be putting forward, um, or losing the protection that 602A1 seems to kind of have been adopted probably to provide, which would you take? And, you know, um, the government responded, well, of course, those horrible results would be terrible, and so we wouldn't want that. And I said, okay, well, we just lost the case. Um, <laughs> and, um, 
you know, and of course, Justice Ginsburg notes in her dissent that if he was very careful to say, but of course, it's a false, it's a false dichotomy, and, and that's all, that's fine. But that's why, you know, if you, if I had to bet a dollar, I would say that Justice Alito probably changed his position. Um, although I have no idea. Let me just hasten to say. Um, I have no idea. But my, my guess is that when he, when, when he heard that answer, he, and, and it, there's a clue to that in his concurrence. Because in his concurrence, he says, look, I don't, he joins Justice Kagan in saying, I don't really think this result is right. And that's one of the weird things about this opinion is there's five justices who say, what we're doing is not what Congress intended. But there's only, but at the same time, there aren't five votes to do what Congress intended because, and for very good institutional reasons, the court was not at liberty to revisit what happened in Quality King. And once you say um, that the, the um, importation restriction is subject to first sale, it creates this issue that can only be resolved, uh, at least as it, the case was presented. We tried to come up with a different solution, and in the, in the um, Costco case, we actually tried to suggest a different reading of lawfully made under this title that would deal with the problems um, and that would ensure that the first sale doctrine had an appropriate scope to deal with the kind of situation where someone, uh, you know, the U.S. publisher just happens to print it overseas but, but brings it in and sells it in the United States. Because, again, nobody sitting in this room thinks for a second that you should be able to impose downstream restraints on a copy um, that you, the copyright owner, has brought into the United States and sold. No one thinks that. And so an, a reading of the statute that permits that is not, is not an attractive one, and it's indeed one that the court just wouldn't accept. Um, so so there, are, there are a couple of things. I want to move the discussion now along in the direction of, of next things. There are a couple of things about the, the prior opinion that, that, that fascinate me. One is, of course, that I'm always very happy to see any substantial citation to Cook on Littleton. And the other is that, as I sometimes tell my students, it, it occasionally, perhaps more than occasionally, but at, at least in this case, we have an illustration of the fact that sometimes, maybe that's the best way to say it, uh, friend of the court briefs really matter. And one of the ways they matter is that they present courts with information about the possible consequences of their decisions that might not otherwise be available to them through the presentation of the parties. A great disagreement between the majority and the dissent in this opinion is the status of the list of possible bad consequences, not so much internal to the publishing industry itself, but for the institutions of the cultural sector, which the friend of the court briefs in this case went to lengths to detail. Justice Breyer takes them very seriously indeed, and Justice Ginsburg dismisses them as an unlikely parade of horribles. And we have, in, in the persons of, of, of Jonathan and Brandon, two of the individuals who contributed substantially to one of the briefs that had an impact on the majority and was largely dismissed in its significance by the dissent. And I'd like to, to move the discussion now toward a, the question of whether or not those examples were, in fact, um, substantial ones, and whether, as we move into the next stage of this discussion, which is presumably the legislative sequel to the judicial story, we need to take those possible bad consequences Seriously, and I thought I'd ask Jonathan to say a little bit about that that list of of, of downstream bad consequences and its its role in the decision, and then I might I might ask 
Brandon to begin the discussion of what we think of the significance of those examples going forward. Well, I think the decision certainly makes a lot of the parade of horribles. Certainly Breyer takes them very seriously. Now, what's interesting, and we really can't, you know, for purposes of going forward, you can't underestimate the point that Aaron made, right? You know, sort of saying, you know, no one is saying that if you, if it's made overseas and then imported by the rights holder and then sold here, that the first sale doctrine shouldn't apply to that. Okay, so that's a very important point. Now, but the Second Circuit did not agree with that. I mean, the Second Circuit's interpretation was that that scenario is, would be an infringement for, you know, the first sale doctrine would not apply to the purchaser of that copy. That is what the Second Circuit said. I mean, what Aaron was articulating was sort of the Ninth Circuit rule, which, again, the question is, does the statutes get you there? And, you know, the various provisions, you know, probably, you know, I guess the court concluded didn't get us there. And so you had to come up with either the jerry-rigged solution of the Solicitor General or sort of saying, well, that, you know, you can't get there, so we don't get there, which is what Justice Breyer did in the majority. But the point is, I would say that the parade of horribles, probably 95 percent of them are really stem from the Second Circuit's rule. And, you know, with Aaron's stipulation, right, a lot of those, not all of the parade of horribles, but much of the parade of horribles goes away. And so as we sort of look forward to the legislative debate, you know, I certainly wouldn't want to give you advice, Alan. I certainly couldn't promise you anything. But I think the rights holders will be in a much better position from a legislative point of view if they don't try to defend what really is undefensible, meaning from a policy perspective, the Second Circuit rule, that it somehow turns on the place of manufacture. And it doesn't, you know, and the first sale doctrine would not apply even if the rights holder imported it and sold it in the United States. I mean, that's a ridiculous position from a policy perspective, because what that would do is encourage every rights holder to move all manufacturing overseas, right, because then you have the ability to control your distribution. And so that can't possibly be a good policy outcome. So I think the rights holders, if I were their counsel, I would say right away, we're not going to defend, we're not going to advocate for anything like the Second Circuit view of the world. We're going to start, as Aaron did, really, from the, you know, the Ninth Circuit, you know, again, forget the words of the Ninth Circuit, forget the words of the existing statute, but from a policy perspective saying, you know, that they would start that the first sale doctrine applies, it turns on where the product is sold, not where the product is made. So if it's sold in the United States, first sale doctrine always applies. If it's sold overseas, first sale doctrine doesn't apply. Now, I'm not saying that that's the right policy. I would say that the first sale doctrine should apply regardless of where it's sold. But I think, again, from the policy discussion, you know, logically, the only real choices are, you know, are, does it, does it, where is it, where, the first sale doctrine should turn on where the product is sold, not where the product is made. Brandon, I know you've been talking to some people on the Hill for a while now in anticipation of this decision going one way or the other. Can you give us a sense of how you think the legislative phase of this is likely to shape up? Sure, yeah. So we're lucky enough to be a part of a pretty broad coalition, the Owner's Rights Initiative, that has not only libraries, but there are retailers, people, you know, Redbox, people that rent videos to you, right? Everyone that basically 
relies on uh, the ability to dispose of things that they've already bought once. Um, they've gotten together into this coalition to try to work on this issue and, and work together on the Hill. Um, and we, we really, <laughs> we expected the dissent to be the majority. I mean, we really expected to be on the offensive here. We've been doing a lot of good work reaching out to people and basically trying to uh, live by the, the, you know, the holy no surprise rule on the Hill, which is, you know, this is something we care about. This is something we're going to be bugging you about in the future, so we're going to go ahead and start bugging you about it now. Um, so we've been laying that groundwork for a while now, um, and now I guess we're going to be on the defensive. We expect that, the you know, th it's right, that, you know, if you can possibly, um, just the same way that it's nice to have windows, right, and charge a lot, for the for the big screen release and then charge a little bit less, you know, or to have the hardback and the softback, all that kind of ways of segmenting markets and market discrimination is highly profitable. So the folks that want to do that are going to go and ask for more tools to do that. Um, I think, though, that that as Jonathan said, I think our ideal solution is what we just got in this decision. And, and while there may be room to talk about whether market segmentation is working for folks using the other mechanisms that are available to them, I think, I think we're going to push back on the idea that they also need to be able to bring a copyright infringement claim in order to uh, control uh, the flow of goods. Uh, as, as Ariel was pointing out, 602 applies to all sorts of things other than things that are lawfully purchased. And so there is some control that's created by 602. Um, but there are other ways to control your markets, right? You can you, you have contractual agreements with the people that are your wholesalers abroad. You know, you can control how much stuff you flood into the market, right? So that there's not a bunch of leftover copies sitting in a warehouse in Bangladesh that then gets sold and brought back here. So I think that there's going to be a serious conversation about whether copyright should be one of the tools that you can use when there are other tools and when there are other industries that have this same question of selling goods in, in the U.S. and abroad, and their goods aren't copyrighted, and yet they seem to be making a living. And so there are there are I think there's going to be a, a hearty appetite amongst those of us who were on the owner's rights side to hold on to this opinion and keep the broadest, simplest version of first sale that we can have. Um, certainty really counts for a lot in business and you know, for different reasons, right? Huge businesses need simple rules because every bit of friction becomes amplified. You know, it's like a little grain of sand inside of an oyster, and it becomes a, it gets, it just irritates, right? So every little bit of friction um, can amplify itself into huge costs for big corporations. So every little legal glitch that they have to constantly litigate and lawyer up and put into contracts is annoying for them. And then for small and nonprofit places like libraries, every bit of uh, complexity is something that we can't afford to litigate. It's not that we lose money, it's that we just stop doing stuff. So when we're talking about what should the right rule be going forward, if it's a very complex rule that says, well, libraries can have, you know, like the rules that are in there now, they're already the 602 rules that are in there say, well, five copies, but what if you need ten copies? If you're in a, in a, in a um, as many libraries are, uh, a multilinguistic community, right, and you have the vast majority of your patrons are Spanish-speaking, you need to buy those books, and you need to go to where those books are, and five copies of a best-selling book is not enough. Um, or that 602 exception doesn't apply to every kind of medium, right? And so there are going to be some kinds of things, again, if you're serving a multicultural uh, group of patrons, as we are nowadays, we need the ability to go out there and get that stuff wherever it is, and we don't need to be having to sign contracts and lawyer up when we do it. So this is the best case scenario. It's going to be real. You're going to kind of have to pry this from the library's cold, dead hands. <laughs> Alan. Um, I mean, what's clear when you hear all of us talk about this is this is a classic case of the tail wagging the dog. The, the case is really about the question of what a copyright owner's rights are uh, seen through the distribution right with respect to these questions about unauthorized importation. The first sale doctrine sort of took over this case in a way that sort of has split the world. I mean, you know, Brandon says that there are other folks who are doing business uh, internationally who seem to be doing quite well 
yeah, that's because if you're not involved in the sale of copyright-based works, you are allowed to engage in market segmentation. And there's no question. If you were to ask Amazon, for example, does it sell the Kindle in exactly the same version and at the same price in every market throughout the world? Of course it doesn't. Because in many of those markets, it wouldn't stand a chance of having any kind of customers based upon what the people in that particular region can afford. So, you know, unfortunately, this, this notion of the Second Circuit basically glomming on to the five words of the first sale doctrine codification in this act steered this case in a direction that led to Justice Breyer, who I think, you know, can be fairly said to have something of a jaundiced view of copyright to begin with, uh, into his tortured linguistic analysis uh, of those provisions, you know, where he did his best to try to make sure that he could rationally explain how his analysis did not make 602A1 either pointless or superfluous. But unfortunately, when you reach the result that he reached, he managed to make the exceptions that Congress provided, whether you thought they were adequate or not in terms of the numbers, Congress provided exceptions in 602A3 that now are indeed pointless and superfluous based upon the, the ruling of the court. Because if the first sale doctrine is going to govern essentially this question with respect to what can be imported in the nature of copyright-based goods that are intended to be only sold in foreign markets, then what's the point of those exceptions that Congress provided? The other interesting thing about this is, is that we're left with an extraordinarily bad taste from Justice Breyer and, and the majority opinion about his view of current developments in terms of international trade. I mean, he, make, he makes a statement, which I, I just found absolutely extraordinary in here, uh, where uh, having conceded that this decision is going to make it difficult, perhaps impossible, he says, for publishers and other copyright holders to divide foreign and domestic markets, we can find no principle of copyright law that suggests that publishers are especially entitled to such rights. And he says, the Constitution's language nowhere suggests that its limited exclusive rights should include a right to divide markets or a concomitant right to charge different purchases, different prices for the same book. But what he doesn't say is there's nothing in the Constitution that forbids that. And there is a great deal to point to in federal statutory law that indicates that Congress contemplated that that would be permitted. And now we have a situation where American commerce is going to be bifurcated. If you happen to be in the business of producing copyright-based products, you're going to be looking over your shoulder at the effect of the first sale doctrine on the potential ability that you have to establish foreign markets for those works. But that's not going to be a problem for the manufacturers and distributors of non-copyright-based products. That doesn't make any sense at all in terms of the needs of the American economy and in terms of the way U.S. law addresses, ultimately, uh, the increasing involvement of U.S. businesses in global trade. Ariel? Yeah, a, a few things. Um, I, I wouldn't um, – I don't think it's fair to, to put at the Second Circuit the responsibility for having decided that this case turned on, on the five words that are in Section 109. I think, I think that is a function of Quality King. Um, at the point in which the court in Quality King, in a 9-0 decision, said that the importation provision in 602 is subject to 109, it put all of the later courts in the position of needing to decide, as Aaron said, well, okay, how do we interpret the words lawfully made under this title? And Quality King sort of, it, it created this issue where the court had already decided that if a good was made in the United States, exported and brought back in, there would be no market segmentation. I mean, that, that is the square holding of Quality King, whether one likes it or not. What that does is it puts later advocates dealing with the issue in the position of needing to argue not about whether or not market segmentation is good or bad, not about whether Congress intended market segmentation or not, but the question became if Congress intended market segmentation to be the thing that the Copyright Act protects, why would it do so only for goods that are made abroad and not goods made at home? And it was, it was that, that question that had no real satisfying answer. 
I wouldn't want the audience to be left with the impression that something about this decision forecloses the ability of copyright holders to engage in market segmentation. It doesn't. That is just categorically wrong. The only thing this decision does is say if you engage in market segmentation and you happen to be a copyright holder, you can't use the Copyright Act to enforce that market segmentation. In that sense, it's not putting a copyright holder on worse terms than non-copyright holders. It's putting them on the same position as non-copyright holders. I don't see how it's putting them on the same term. Where is the first sale doctrine that shadows, for example, automobile manufacturers or Coca-Cola in the sale of their product at different price points in different countries? Yeah, but nothing stops me from going to Mexico and buying Coca-Cola if it's cheaper there and re-importing it. I mean, that's arbitrage. Arbitrage is the way, you know, the vast majority of markets in the vast majority of products work. No, but there is also an entire custom scheme that basically does allow these producers of goods to be able to police their markets. And the point that was made about... The whole idea of these free trade agreements is to lower and eliminate all of those barriers. I mean, the idea is, in theory, there shouldn't be barriers. And if I buy, you know, if I can buy wool more cheaply in another market and then import it here and make money, then that's, you know, an undersell, you know, the authorized distributors or whatever, then so be it. I mean, that's the way arbitrage has worked for millennia. I mean, I think the one thing that you do need to acknowledge, though, and, you know, again, you can look at it all sorts of different ways, and this is unquestionably a public policy decision on which there's arguments on both sides. But when you're talking about copyrighted, you know, copyright industries in particular, and let's, you know, what's interesting is both Quality King and Costco were cases that were not about copyright industries. And I was, when I was arguing the Costco case, I was kind of worried a little bit about that, but it never was a problem, and it wasn't the basis on which Quality King was decided either. Quality King was about shampoo. But, you know, in the classic industries like, you know, music recording and publishing and now video, I mean, you're talking about something where the substrate on which the product is produced is not the value. The value really is built on the intellectual property. And so there is a very reasonable argument to be made that building the ability to segment markets into the property right that is granted and saying we're going to, we are going to say you can print, because, again, the marginal cost of producing the next DVD or the next book is extremely low, and much lower than it is for something like a car, where, you know, the opportunity to arbitrage, you know, automobile prices, it exists, but the fact of the matter is that the cost of goods in an automobile is much higher. So you could make a judgment that it's actually much more important in the case of something, you know, the copyright industries, to say we are going to provide this protection precisely to ensure that copyright holders can provide their goods into markets in a way that will be accessible to those markets as well as here. That actually, it doesn't hurt, you know, in theory, that actually will help everybody if that can be done in an efficient way. And, you know, you could say that that's actually not right and that it's much, you're much better off not to have those kinds of, that kind of segmentation. But the fact of the matter is that it puts people, it puts these intellectual property industries in a really tough position now, because if you look at the price, for example, of, you know, I was just going around the web a little bit to see what people were saying about this decision, and one of the comments was somebody who said, you know, you should set up your business now importing Chinese DVDs, because a DVD that in the United States might cost $19 or $9 might cost 99 cents or $1.50 in China. And the reason it costs 99 cents or $1.50 in China is partly because that is reflective of what people can afford, but it also is reflective of the fact that the industries are competing with much more pervasive piracy and other things that mean that if they try to sell it at $9.99, it's going to be 
um, they can't sell any because it's going to be piratical copies that are taking over. So there are lots of considerations that are integral to the intellectual property nature of what's at stake um, that will have to be considered. Um, and you know, the, in, in, undoubtedly, if Congress thinks that what it tried to do, what I, I think it tried to do in 602A1 is still worth doing, um, <coughs> then undoubtedly the, the project will be, in light of what the Supreme Court has done, to ensure that it's drafted in such a way that it doesn't create any sorts of uh, bad consequences, but simply does permit um, the kind of market segmentation that was at the core of, of what was being done. And again, there's arguments in favor of that and against it, but there are very powerful arguments that um, it's a net plus for everybody if that segmentation can be done. Um, and it's simply, you know, yes, you can try to segment in other ways, but the reason that the provision was added to the statute, and again, you know, but the, the, the legislative history certainly supports the idea that the reason that the provision was added to the statute is that um, contractual restrictions are not sufficient to uh, do this um, in a way that's enforceable. But, but I, uh, uh, did, uh, well, sorry, no, I had a question for Aaron, actually. Um, do you think so? Do you think that the impact of the decision, of this decision, the curtsaying decision, um, rather than destroying this um, uh, sort of process of market segmentation, do you think that it might facilitate a better opportunity for a price correction with respect to the different regions, with respect to these products? Um, so rather than just taking out yeah. the uh, competitors such as Supap entirely um, out of the equation, bringing them into the equation might potentially just uh, have the copyright owners and manufacturers rethink the prices at which they, they, the prices which they set for these products in different regions. I mean, I, I think that's sort of two sides of the same coin. Right. I mean, and that's why I think there's there's great arguments to be made that market segmentation, you know, is not a good thing and. That, you know, and maybe that's where Congress will come out. But um, when you say, you know, they'll have to readjust the price, what you're saying is you can't market, you, you, you can no longer achieve market segmentation the way you could before. And so you're, the price you're going to choose mm -hmm. is going to be different as a result. Um, and it may be that the prices will go down in the U.S. and they'll go up in Thailand, and maybe that's great. But you still maintain the market segmentation the way that you sort of wanted to maintain it except that you now have to factor in this increased competition in adjusting the price. Yeah. And I think, you know, Aaron's right. I mean, there's a lot of policies going in every direction. But when you're saying, you know, who, who is, who's harmed, well, under a market segmentation situation scenario that is enforced by copyright law, uh, so it's a very rigid market segmentation, uh, you know, the person who's harmed is the U.S. consumer. And indeed, Justice Ginsburg says, uh, you know, the, the, the court embraces an international exhaustion rule that could benefit U.S. consumers, but would likely disadvantage foreign holders of U.S. copyrights. So, you know, that's, you know, even how Justice Ginsburg says we're basically talking about, you know, U.S. consumers, uh, foreign rights holders. Because I think, again, we have to remember, you know, it's easy to say, oh, it's U.S. consumers, U.S. rights holders, but it gets a lot more complicated than that. And who are, you know, U.S. rights holders can very well be foreign companies, uh, foreign producers, foreign manufacturers. And so, you know, when, when you start looking at the whole policy, you have to sort of, you know, it's not just U.S. Pr producers as opposed to U.S. consumers. It's, you know, it's, it's U.S. consume, you know, it can be foreign producers against U.S. consumers. You know, and I'm not a con uh, an economist, as is probably evident to everybody, but um, I will just say that the idea that it is certainly right that if you eliminate copyright restrictions on importation that American consumers will be better off, I, I, don't, I don't think that every economist would agree with that. So, well, which, no. Um, why don't, if it's okay, let's, let's hear what our, our audience wants to ask the panel, either to specific individuals or as a, as a sort of toss-up to the group. Who would like to start? Please. Sure. What do you, do you think that uh, federal, do you think that common law for copyright 
is the same as common law for patents. And what effect will this decision have on the sale of patented products abroad? So the current rule in the Federal Circuit is that foreign sale is not exhaustive. So you are exactly right. The patent law does not have a statutory exhaustion doctrine. It's a common law exhaustion doctrine. And under the current Federal Circuit law, a foreign sale does not exhaust the exclusive right to sell under the patent law. And whether the – I think that it would be very consistent for the Federal Circuit to say, you know, this is – this is all a creation of statute. We think the common law suggests that there's no exhaustion because you haven't exercised your exclusive rights under U.S. patent law by a sale overseas. And so we don't think there's any exhaustion. This doesn't affect our – this doesn't affect our doctrine. And whether that is something that either the Federal Circuit will want to relook at in light of this or whether it will end up going up, I think, is a very fair question for the future. Please. Just a quick comment on Aaron's, I guess, penultimate point. I think an economist would say that the effect on U.S. consumers involves both static and dynamic effects. Clearly, the static effect is favorable. The dynamic effect is ambiguous, and we just don't know. And that's pretty much the fundamental question of all IP, which is what are the dynamic effects. I think the question I want to ask that Peter might be the best position to answer is, as I recall the statutory context, the 76 Act had a manufacturing clause. And so at that time, Congress wouldn't have been thinking about the publishing industry with regards to this issue. And did that figure in? Am I misreading that context? Not misreading, but I think that since you invited me to start, I'm more interested in what my panelists have to say. It's, I think, very clear by the time the 76 Act is finally enacted into law that the manufacturing clause is a thing of the past. It's being phased out. The terms of the phase out are very clear in the 1976 Act. It had been the major device for regulating international traffic in both hard and soft rights relating to books for a century, more or less, or close to a century. But by this time, I don't think anyone expected that the manufacturing clause would remain in that sovereign role. So one, I mean, the legislative history that gets cited in the case is really from the mid-60s through 67. So it is peculiar that, in fact, you couldn't have engaged in this practice at the time that the law passed. But it does sound like there is legislative history that contemplated a world where this might happen. Well, but I think, but it does, the whole manufacturing clause and the long history of the manufacturing clause does, at some level, inform the interpretation of what does, you know, 109A mean. And certainly Breyer, Justice Breyer, talks about that. Now, again, whether, you know, you agree with how he discusses it is another question. But certainly, I mean, the notion that, you know, for, you know, however many years, we basically, you know, the copyright law favored copies made in the United States and disadvantaged copies made overseas. And then all of a sudden, in 76, flipped that and gave more protection to copies made overseas and less protection to copies made in the U.S. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. And so certainly, to the extent you're trying to figure out what does 109A mean, you know, what does lawfully made under this title mean, you know, I think that that history certainly would suggest that, you know, it couldn't possibly mean that foreign copies are advantaged vis-a-vis American-made copies. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. That concludes argument in this case.
Thanks. I, I did have one brief comment uh, and wanted to have a question on 602, but the, the comment, I guess, maybe is a longstanding debate with, with John on uh, uh, if we shifted this to requiring that the copy be sold in the United States, we've never had that. We call it the first sale doctrine, but ever since 1909, it has never, ever required a sale, uh, even in the first 1909 codification and certainly not in, in 1976. You just had to be the owner or in 1909 the possessor of the copy. And I think that's really important going forward, considering the number of us who uh, get licenses to make a copy onto our, our own device. So uh, uh, if I own the piece of paper and I have a license to reproduce your poem onto it, I still own the piece of paper, even though it was never sold. And first sale doctrine, I think, automatically, we always knew attached to that kind of situation. So I think it would be a, a pretty big step to, to depart from that and suggest that this only applies to copies that were sold and not copies that were made under license by the person who owned the tangible medium. Uh, but I've noticed that the, the panel's focus here has been very heavily on 602 and the importation right and what happens and how important it is and market segmentation. I think one reason we won the case, and I say we because I, I still have two cases going on this and, and worked with, uh, with, with Kurt Sang's attorney on this, was to make sure that this was not about 602. That's what the publishers wanted it to be. And the focus was to say 602 is part of the distribution right. This is all about 109. And in fact, if you go back in the complaints, I know the complaints in my cases, and I'm, I'm pretty sure it was the same with Kurt saying, they didn't even allege an importation. They alleged that it, they were all pretty much cookie cutter the same. They bought our books and they sold them in the United States. It, and, and it mentions that the books were made abroad and not intended to be sold in the United States. But allegation of the importation was not the key to their complaint. Uh, and uh, the, key, the key to our turning this around was to say, look, you don't need to look for a justification of anything left in 602. 602 is superfluous, not in the sense that it doesn't have any meaning. It has just as much meaning as the exclusive right to give away the copy. That's certainly part of the, the, the 1063 rights. Uh, you have the exclusive right to give away the copy until you no longer own it. Then the owner of the copy can do it without your permission. So I guess the question is, and maybe I'm addressing it more to Alan, why should the act of importing have any super uh, power beyond the act of giving away, lending, passing on through, or through uh, uh, inheritance, uh, why should the act of importing, which is simply carrying the copy across the border, have, have any different treatment than all of the other forms of distribution of the copy, which nobody is saying that they're superfluous because of 109. They still exist as long as you own the copy. I, I guess I would, would, would say that, that part of that has to do with the fact that you know, this is statutory law reflecting public policy decisions made by Congress, which reflects Congress's view of how, uh, you know, certain things evolve, including the issue of global trade. I mean, the reason the manufacturing clause's life was limited was that transportation, communication, uh, all kinds of technological developments ultimately meant that the difference between the way American businesses operated in terms of how they got their products manufactured at the early part of the 20th century was vastly different by the latter part of the 20th century. And I think what Congress was doing was simply reflecting that difference uh, and also reflecting a, a sort of a good solid bet, one that really didn't have much of a drawback to it, that this was going to become more so in the future. Uh, global trade is such now that, frankly, you know, while we tend to, to uh, have disagreements as a matter of public policy over whether it's a good thing or a bad thing to shift your manufacturing overseas. The reality is, is that there's only penalties for certain people who do that and for others there's not. I mean, the big story earlier this year about the extent to which Apple is manufacturing overseas created a momentary storm and then passed. You don't see Congress reacting to it. You don't see Congress trying to cut back or place any restrictions on the capability of Apple to do that. And the reason is, is I think that it reflects a reality that Congress is dealing with about how global trade is continuing to develop. 
and they want to create options with respect to American businesses. There are going to be many American businesses that, you know, will, for a variety of reasons, adhere to a kind of a buy American uh, posture because they think it's good for their markets. They think it fits their particular products. Uh, for others, however, you know, the allure of cheaper labor, uh, fewer regulatory uh, requirements to deal with is ultimately going to be part and parcel of what continues to drive the growth of the U.S. economy. And to the extent that people see this as having an impact on jobs at home, uh, it's going to be something that is going to continue to be flexible uh, in the eyes of Congress. I, I think that a senator band, for example, might view some of these issues a little bit differently uh, than lawyer ban does, representing the library community. And, and that's one of the things I'm kind of interested in. It always, all depends on my campaign country. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I, I, think, I think it's going to be interesting to see how these issues do play out in the political process. So we have, Hi. We are, we're near the end. But Last Sorry. question, I guess. Um, this is a question for Alan. You've been involved in copyright lobbying for years, probably longer than anybody in the room, and you know how it's become more and more volatile and contentious over time. I, I'm, I'm assuming that your people are already thinking about what is the legislative fix. Can you describe what the legislative fix is, from your opinion, that would also be agreeable to people that want to have garage sales and people that want to lend books? Well, in all honesty, I would have to say that if I could, I wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> not, not yet. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, is that, no, I can't. Um, we have been working through this issue. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that has been a problem for, for, for me, and I'll share with you just in terms of representing the industry I represent, is that, that while from the outside people view it as, you know, you're all book publishers, it, they're really, it's a highly sectoral industry where people in different sectors are in entirely different businesses. I mean, they consider themselves to be in entirely different businesses. So on an issue like this, it's, it's a fairly difficult thing to parse through this kind of court decision and to see if there is a, you know, a good fix that occurs to all of us that makes sense to each of the different sectors and also will pass some initial political tests. Um, one of the things that, that we're very much aware of is the fact that uh, the gray markets have a good deal of support in Congress uh, because they are, in many ways, viewed as good for American consumers. And so it's not going to be an easy task uh, to try to fix the result of this decision if the fix is going to be viewed as in any way constraining the gray markets in ways that are thought to uh, disadvantage American consumers. Um, you know, I, I ideally what, what I suppose I would like to spend my time thinking about, again, is a way of addressing these issues by focusing on Section 602, not on the first sale doctrine. I mean, we have not lobbied at any time I've been in this business to change the first sale doctrine in any way. We, we you know, when the Bob's Merrill case was decided, the book publishing industry accepted it. They Were you lobbying back then, too? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it feels that way. But, but they accepted it, and, you know, used book, used book uh, uh, sales have been a part of the scene for well over a century. But it has been the change, the shift that has come with the digital landscape that has made people reexamine some of these issues. One thing we haven't talked about, of course, Peter might be interested in this, is whether or not this, this decision is also going to drive... Uh, certain efforts to make changes in copyright law in the first sale doctrine, specifically with respect to works in digital form. This was not an issue in the case. It was not an issue, indeed, in any of these cases. But it seems to be a logical issue that flows out of this case. And, of course, that's going to complicate matters even further. On which note... Um, we will invite you all to come back in a year's time or so. <laughs> so where we all are. Maybe we'll some, some of the wonderful guests will return, and, and let's please acknowledge them.